Well, church, this morning we are so excited to have Pastor James Sonic in the house. He's from Victory Life Church down in Battle Creek, Michigan. Victory Life is one of our affiliate churches. And some of you may or may not remember he used to be on staff here. So let's give a warm Resurrection Life Church welcome, Pastor James Sonic. Man, worship was amazing. It is good to be in the house. Uh, it, you know, I'm like that college kid that went off to college and he come, he's come back for a visit. It's familiar, but it's different. Uh, but I have raided the fridge in the back and uh, Pastor Dwayne and Jeannie didn't know what to make when we brought our dirty laundry home to, to clean, but we'll sort that out. Well, how are we doing this morning? All right. It looks like uh, most of you, uh, you're running a little slow. You were up late last night watching the Michigan victory, weren't you? Come on. Let's get a zoom in on the muck here because let's really celebrate it. Let's give it up for the Fair State Bulldogs national champions. Oh, so good to be together. And... Um, just excited. I tell you what, uh, a lot of good things I want to introduce. My beautiful bride of 30 years, uh, the ever famous Eileen. And we were up here 18 years ago. Oh, come on, honor her. She put up with me for 18 years. The woman's a saint. The woman's a saint. Um, and uh, 18 years ago, we interned up here. I was in the corporate world. Pastor Dwayne gave me an opportunity to fulfill a lifelong dream to go into full-time ministry. I was making close to $100,000. He offered me $31,000 and no job after 18 months. Who could say no to a deal like that, right? I said, I'm in, maybe. And uh, I have not regretted a moment since. Uh, I love the man, and he gave me my chance. And, uh, and it's been amazing. So 18 years ago, we got launched down to Battle Creek, uh, Tony Tiger, serial city of the world, a lot of loss down there. And we started with about 50 people. We're running about 2,000 people now on the weekend. And it's been amazing. It really has. We, we've seen already uh, over 200 people give their lives to Christ this year alone. And so it's exciting to see what God is doing down there. Uh, and then one of the things I want to highlight is uh, I've got a picture I want to show you. I've got the best job in the world and uh, the best life. And uh, I'm going to hold it right there for a moment because as I build to the, the best life here, not only do I have a beautiful bride, uh, I've got three boys, all grown, loving the Lord, married three beautiful uh, women. So we've got three daughters, uh, two grandchildren, and one on the way. So that's good. The middle one, first word he ever spoke out loud, and clearly, I kid you not, was Grandpa. No, oh, come on, man. I gave him the keys to the car. I'm paying for his college already. <laughs> love him. Love them all. But this, this, uh, this picture I took last Wednesday, and it's, it, it was a moment that's actually stuck with me uh, since Wednesday night. I was at a, at a restaurant, and as I'm eating, this lady just kind of keeps looking at me, and kind of every time I'd look, she'd kind of nod and smile. And so there's that awkward moment where I realized, okay, if I ignore this, then I'm an unfriendly pastor if she recognizes me as a pastor. But if she doesn't recognize me as a pastor, that I'm going to get beat up by her husband standing uh, right there. But, you know, she just kind of nods. And so what, I, I knew she was familiar. She looked familiar. I knew she had been to our church. And so when I got up, she came over and said, Pastor James, do you, do you remember me? And I said, I actually do. I, I, I said, uh, the story came right back to me. And I said, I cannot remember your name. But uh, this was her story. She said, four years ago, we came to your church for the first time. And my 22-year-old son came with us, and in your service four years ago, first time in the door, he gave his life to Jesus Christ, and he was shot and killed two days later. And she goes, we've just started to come back to church, and, and uh, she goes, we are just so thankful for you. And for the next couple days, I thought, I'm so thankful that our Heavenly Father loves us enough that when he knows our days are numbered and short, he gives us one last chance to discover him. I'm thankful that he led him into Victory Life Church with 48 hours left. I'm thankful that I had a pastor that taught me that whenever you preach, you give an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. And now, because of his mentorship, his discipleship in my life, this is one of many families that for all of eternity, their lives are changed. Will you help me honor your pastor? I love this man. He's a good man. <laughs> pastor Dwayne Vanderklok. 
All right, let's open up with a word of prayer. We're going to get it right into the word. So, Father God, thank you so much for this community that we live in. Thank you for your favor. We pray for your favor to be upon our city. We pray, Lord, for our police and our fire and our servicemen and women. We pray a hedge of protection over them. We pray that you keep them safe, that you give them wisdom and discernment in situations. Father, we pray for the churches in our city. We pray that they will be a beacon of hope and light, that you will draw the hurting and the lost to them, Father God. And we pray, Father... Uh, that Pastor Duane continues to see healing with his knee replacement. We pray that this week, Lord, there will be an opportunity for each of us to share our story with someone else on how only you can change a life. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, that story right there just reminds us how important it is that this week you are intentional to invite people to Easter. There's people that would never go to church with you, but there's an awareness, a spiritual awakening that comes with Easter and Christmas that I can guarantee you, if you will invite somebody, they will come on Easter. And, and it just reminds us that life is short, that we got to seize every opportunity uh, to spread the gospel. So I'll tell you what, are we ready for church today? All right, let's buckle in. I want to welcome everybody that's, on, that's watching us on live stream and online. We're so glad you could be with us today. Church, let's welcome our online community. Let's show them the love. We're glad you're here. All right, if you have your Bibles, let's open up to Matthew chapter 4. And I'm going to give you a chance to get there. I'm going to touch on James chapter 1. I want to talk to you today, and I'm going to continue this message tonight, really, because I want to talk to you today about uh, how to come out of your desert, because we all go through desert seasons, and in those desert seasons, I, I've had some pretty dark uh, desert seasons, and I'm sure uh, I know you have too. Desert seasons can equip you for the things of God or the enemy can use them to entrap you. A desert season is a difficult time. The Bible says you can fall into trials of various kinds. And so it is, it is embracing a relationship with Christ and allowing him to lead you through the desert. Because in that desert, like I said, that desert will either equip you for the things that God has in your life, or the devil will use them to entrap you that the devil will do everything he can to keep you out of eternity. And if he can't keep you out of eternity, the next thing he'll do is he'll try to keep you trapped in the desert. And yes, there really is a devil. You can't believe in Jesus and not believe there's a devil. The Ephesians tells us we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. This desert season is not a natural season. It is a spiritual battle. You will never come out of the desert on your own strength. But the good news is Jesus Christ will give you the strength to walk out of any desert. And when you trust him, there's a beauty in the desert. As Joseph said to his brothers, what man meant for evil, God can turn to good. There, there's a beauty. I, I'm telling you, I wouldn't want to wish upon anybody the deserts I've been through, but I would not trade those deserts for anything in my life because of how I've seen the love of God move during those desert seasons. And, and, it, and it's allowing him to, to move us through those things. And so Jesus gives us the example of how we want to move through. And the devil will do everything he can to keep you trapped. How many of you realized you were not meant to live 40 years wandering in your desert? but you are to be led through and empowered to come out of the desert. And, and so it says in Isaiah 61 that, that he trades our ashes for beauty, that an oil of joy for mourning, for the garment of praise instead of despair. And even though these are, can be dark times, when we learn to trust our Father and be led by the Holy Spirit, those can be life-changing and they can be empowered. A good example of how I can illustrate this, because maybe you're in the middle of a desert right now. Maybe right now you're heartbroken and you're, you're in a dark place and, and, and there's a lot of pain and you're just like, I'm having a hard time trying to find the, the, the joy and the purpose of this, the beauty of this. I remember when Eileen was pregnant with our first one, Caleb, and uh, we were in a small group then. And, and she was literally about two weeks away from giving birth to our first son. So all of this at this point is new territory for us. I mean, you have two or three kids, it's like, no big deal, says the man. Okay, uh, 
So we're, we're, we're all excited. You know, we're just watching changes happen by the week, and now we're at T-minus two weeks to go. She is now starting to get a little fearful because she knows this is going to be a painful experience. And, and after small group, all the ladies gather around the pregnant lady. That's just what naturally the, the women do. There's a pregnant lady, they gather around, then they all go to the bathroom together. I don't, I don't get it. But there's the pregnant lady. So all the ladies gather around Eileen, and I'm watching across the room, and they're like, how you feeling? How you doing? Oh, I'm doing good, and a little nervous. And so then the ladies start going, oh, I remember. I remember my my pregnancy, my delivery, my birth, and they start telling their story. And they're horror stories. They're horrific. They're like, oh, I was in labor for 14 hours, and uh, all natural, and I remember that. And, the, and then the other one didn't want to be outdone. Well, I was in labor for, for seven days, and passed out <laughs> twice, and went home and did a load of laundry. And uh, you know, they're, they're just going around just talking about how, oh my goodness, I, you know, for 42 hours, for 12 hours, for 15 hours, I, I'm in this pain. And, and, and they're all kind of laughing and joking and, oh, sister, I got one to tell you. And I look and here's Eileen two weeks out and she's quiet as a mouse and tears are starting to drip off her cheeks. And at the same time, the circle became aware of what was happening. And here was the difference. They experienced the beauty after the pain. And she had not experienced the beauty yet after the pain. When, when she gave birth to Caleb, instantly they, they, they put our newborn son on, on her chest and she looked at me and she goes, I could do this again. And so he did it two more times. <laughs> and then she goes, I'm done. <laughs> Let's have grandkids. <laughs> and, and so I'm hoping this, this, this helps you when you come out of the desert and you can look back, there's a beauty in that pain as you see the hand of God that is faithful to lead you out. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how God can lead you through the desert and out of the desert. You weren't meant to live in the desert. You, you are meant to be more than a conqueror. You're meant to be led out. You're meant to be led into victory. So... First thing is to understand the mindset to go into the desert. The, the, the desert has a mindset that, that you've got to get ready. And in James chapter 1, it prepares us for that mindset. James chapter 1 tells us this. He said, my brother, he said, consider it or count it all joy when you fall into trials of many kinds. Now that's interesting to count it all joy because it's like, okay, praise God, we're supposed to be a little happy here. Uh, that's not the word. That, that word joy in the Greek is kara, and it means ecstatic, exuberant joy that was associated with freedom, deliverance, and salvation. It wasn't your, let's get a little happy. It was ecstatic joy. The only way I can equate this for you guys is imagine the Detroit Lions winning the Super Bowl times 10, okay? Hey, there's hope, there's a God. But, but it's that, oh yes, exuberance. And here's what he's saying. Now think about this, because if you're in a desert season, this is hard to comprehend. And, and it's more than just having a good attitude and trying to think positive. He says, my brethren, count it all joy, exuberant joy, when you fall into trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. But let perseverance complete its perfect work so that you may be perfect, lacking in nothing. And that word lacking there in the Greek is lipo. And here's, it means this, that you will fall short at nothing. Rather than lacking at nothing, the promise is you'll fall short at nothing. Let patience do its perfect work so that you will be perfect, lacking in nothing, and therefore you won't fall short in anything. Have you ever felt like you've fallen short in life? You ever felt like you've fallen short in your marriage? You've come up short in parenting? Hello, if you're a parent, come on. <laughs> right? There's a reason God doesn't give us the memory of our first three years of life. It's because every parent falls short during those first three years and our kids can't hold it against us, right? No memory. 
You ever feel like you've fallen short in your career path and your goals in life? And he, and he says, count it all joy with exuberance whenever you fall into a trial. And it's interesting because you can, actually, you can fall into trials. There's desert seasons that you didn't count on. Some of you have encountered a desert season that you didn't see coming and you walk home and you find out your spouse is checking out and you didn't see it coming. You're in a desert season. Or something wasn't right and you went to the doctors and that something that wasn't right became a battle for your life and you're in a desert season. You're in a, you've fallen into a trial. You failed a course and you're getting kicked out of the school and it changes your future and all of a sudden you're in a desert season. You've been betrayed, you've been hurt, you walk in and there's a pink slip on your time card and you're in a desert season. And here's what it's saying. It's saying, count it all joy when you face trials of various kinds. Count it all joy. Here, here's what he's saying. If, if you're in the desert, he's saying if you're brokenhearted, count it all joy because you're about to f discover the God that can heal the broken heart. If you lost your job, count it all joy because you're about to discover the God that shall provide all your needs according to his riches and glory. You've been betrayed, hurt, and bitter. Count it all joy because you're about to see a God that can redeem and restore like nothing else on this earth. Count it all joy because when you enter your desert, you're about to discover how great your God is if you will only trust him and allow him to lead you through your desert. That's what he's saying. Count it all joy so that you lack. You will never fall short again. Count it all joy that the only way you get to your destiny, the only way you get to victory is to be allowed to lead, be led through the desert. There's no shortcut. You've got to go through the desert to get to the victory on the other side. Count it all joy because you're about to see God move in your life if you'll just trust him and let him follow or lead you through the desert. And it says, lacking at nothing, that you will not fall short with anything in life. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask his friends on Facebook. <laughs> Just making sure you're paying attention. That's the gospel we can follow sometime, right? I'm telling you, Facebook friends and like it won't get you out of the desert, but God will. You know, somebody asked me, I was going to ask for an amen. Somebody asked me in my church, what does amen mean? I said, it's like a like it on Facebook. They go, oh, okay, like it. <laughs> Can I get a like it? <laughs> and it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And, and that word uh, wisdom there is Sophie, Sophia. And here's the beautiful thing. Sophia is the capacity to understand and act or function accordingly. So here's what I'm trying to say. Here, here's what I'm saying. When you lack and don't understand and don't know how to act accordingly, when you're in your darkest hour and your heart is broken, and you're saying, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to get up tomorrow. He says, ask me. If you don't understand, it's okay. Just ask me. Ask me and I will show you how you're going to walk out of this thing. Isn't that beautiful that it says, if you don't understand, if you lack wisdom, Sophia, if you don't understand, I'm so glad it doesn't say, if you don't understand, fast and pray for 40 days and then come talk to me when I know you're serious. If you don't understand, well, you just read your Bible more often and you might get it. If you don't understand, try harder to be a good person because maybe that's the reason you're stuck right here. I'm so glad that it doesn't say that, but I've read it that way before in my life. But this is what the Father says. I want you to get excited when you're in there because you're about to discover me in a deeper way. And I'm going to equip you so you never fall short in your life again. And if you don't understand what's going on, it's okay to ask. Because I'm a God that when you ask, he gives liberally and without reproach to all. It will be given to him. Isn't that a beautiful letter? A beautiful word from your heavenly father. I'm hoping right now, if you're in the desert, you're starting to get hope that there's a way out. 
Now, if you've got your Bibles, let's open up to Matthew chapter 4. And I'm going to show you how Jesus goes into the desert, but he does it not as the Son of God, but he does it as a man. That he is the deity, he is the, uh, the, the triune God, but in this moment, rather than dealing as God, he decides to deal as a human being so that you and I know the path out of the desert. And so in Matthew chapter 4, I'm going to actually read chapter 3, verse 17, because it really sets up his journey into the desert. Jesus just got baptized, and this is what it says. He just comes out of the water. And in verse 17, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son. Now, if you have your Bibles, or click them on, but if you click them on, don't underline it with a pen. That doesn't work. But if you have your Bibles, underline this verse. This is my son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. In that moment, the father gives a sentence and does three things for his son that he does for you and I to get us through the desert. This is my son. In that moment, he gives acceptance. This is my son. There's acceptance. Who I love, he gives affection. And in whom I am well pleased, he gives affirmation. He gives acceptance. You're my son. You're not an orphan. You're my son. He gives acceptance. Who I'm, whom I love, he gives affection. And who I'm well pleased, he gives affirmation. Jesus has these three things as now he's going to be led into the desert. Follow along with me. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit. I have that underlined because he has received the Spirit. But how many of you realize there is a difference between receiving the Spirit and learning how to be led by the Spirit? A lot of times we receive the Spirit, but we'll just wander in circles going through the desert all of our lives, and you can't get out of the desert until you, are, until you learn how to be led by the Spirit, which is trusting and following the Word of God. So Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, now I have that underlined in my Bible, Think about that question, how disrespectful and how ridiculous that question is. If you are the Son of God, does the devil not know that this is the Son of God? Absolutely he knows it, he is the Son of God. We know this is recorded because when Jesus came across the demoniac full of demons, they cried out, he was the Son of God, have mercy on us, right? He knows Jesus is the Son of God, but this is what the devil will do today to you and I when we go in the desert to trap us in the desert is he begins to question or have us question who, are, who we are and what our identity is. He goes, if you are the Son of God. You almost just wish he would go. I am the Son of God. I am the Son of God. And, and then says, he goes, if you if you are the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. Part of you would just like him to just rub it in the devil's face at this point. Part of you would like to just have him slam dunk this thing right on the devil and go, oh yeah, I'll, I'll show you, I'll, let me eliminate all doubt. There's no if, I am the Son of God. And not only turn those stones into bread, but he could have turned those stones into a bread factory. We could have had Wonder Bread kicking out all day long, just like this, and saying, T take that, I am the Son of God, but that would have done you and I no good because we can't turn stones into bread, and we can't turn stones into a bread factory, but the God that speaks, let there be light, who can create galaxies, could have done that challenge. And this is what he responds with. He responds with the word of the Father. And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but upon every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and asked him to stand on the highest point of the temple. Here's temptation number two. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. But Jesus hit him with the word of God. And he came back and he says, so it is written, do not put your Lord God to the test. And again, temptation number three, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And all this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, he hits him with the word. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him and the angels came and attended to him. 
In Luke, I love how it says in the next verse in Luke, it says, then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit and went to Galilee. What's interesting is when he is baptized, he receives the Spirit. In the desert, he's led by the Spirit. When he comes out of the, the desert, he's empowered by the Spirit. When we trust God and we are willing to trust his word and follow the leading, it empowers our life when we come out on the other side. We discover our destiny. We discover our purpose. We discover our fullness because we're now empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so what I want to do is I want to give you, for those that are holding on, because if you're not in the desert, there's one coming. And he does it because he equips us in the desert. But I want to give you that one thing, the key that will get you out of a desert. Tonight, I'm going to talk on the one thing that keeps people in the desert, the, the most common thing that keeps people in the desert. In 18 years of ministry, I found that there's one most common thing that will trap people in their desert. And we're going to talk about that tonight. But, but here's what I want you to see on how to come out of the desert. And it's found in... in uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 2, first off it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In verse 2, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now it's easy to just brush over that. After 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus, what did he do? He fasted and he prayed. He prayed and he fasted 40 days. Now, we might kind of think, well, he just kind of walked around and, boy, those stones look pretty good right there. And I wish I could eat. No, he had 40 days. The reason we fast today is to remove the distractions in our lives so that our spirit and our hearts can focus on our Father. That prayer is so much more than what I say, but true prayer and the power of prayer is when I hear what the Father has to say. And for 40 days, he removed all the distractions. For 40 days, he sat intimately with his father. For 40 days. It was him and dad to get ready for this desert challenge. In fact, here, here's what I'm going to do. Eileen, she's the introvert, so she loves it when I do this. Come on up here. We, we can read over real quick. He fasted for 40 days. But this was an intimate time with him and his father. And it was, it was Jesus and the father, and he was just saying, it, it's just you and I. No cell phones, no texting, no emails. It's just you and I. And you're going to have my undivided attention. And I want to hear everything that you have to say. And you're the only person I want to be with right now. Eileen's going, is this for real? 40 days, I got you to myself. No. And this is what's going on in the desert, is Jesus sitting with his father. And I didn't get this the first one, but I want my kiss on this one. Okay. For 40 days, Jesus hears his father pour on acceptance. You're my son. You're my son. Don't, don't act like an orphan anymore. Because an orphan has to look after themselves. An orphan has to provide. So you're not an orphan. You're my son. These things that he is saying, he wants to say to you tomorrow morning if you will sit with him and let him share these things to you. For 40 days, he goes, you're my son. You're my daughter. You're my child. You're my son, whom I love. God's love is different than any other love you can discover. God is love. But what makes his love different than any other love that you can receive from any place else is his love never fails. His love conquers what? All things. 
There's not a hurt, there's not a wound, there's not a darkness that his love can't conquer. His love is different. When he says, this is my son whom I love, when he speaks to you and says, you are my son and you are my daughter whom I love, when he puts his love on you, it is a supernatural, powerful love that never forsakes and will never leave you. And it does conquer all things. His love will conquer any hurt, any pain that you're enduring right now in the desert. And for 40 days, he's affirming them and he's saying, you're not an orphan, you're my son. And I love you and I'm putting my love on you and it's gonna conquer anything you're about to face over the next time here with the devil. And he says, I'm well pleased, he affirms. And how important is it that we are affirm from our heavenly father because this is what the enemy, the enemy tries to put us in shame, doesn't he? Guilt, condemnation and shame and there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. He says, don't put any shame on you. You're, you're, in my presence, there is no shame. In my presence, there, yeah, but Lord, I, I've, I've done this and I've done this. And he, listen, there's no shame in my presence. There's no shame in my presence. Whom I am well pleased for 40 days, you are my son whom I love and I'm well pleased. And this is just me. I get this picture after 40 days of a father sitting with his son going, you're my son. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. Because I know the first question out of the devil's mouth, he's going to say, are you the son of God? You're going to go, I know this one. I'm the son of God. Get ready. It's coming, boy. You're my boy. You're my boy. You're my boy. You're my son. You're my son. And I love you. And my love conquers all. And I'm well pleased. I'm well pleased with you. Don't walk in shame. I'm well pleased with you. And I just see this dad, like a football coach, smacking him on the butt going, go get him now, boy, come on. You got it on you, go, go. Get your victory on the other side because you're my boy. And I love you and I'm well pleased with you. And that's what the Father wants to put on you today if you will sit with him and listen. That's the promise that he has. Your desert can be a beautiful, equipping experience to bring you out the other side because he is faithful. Amen.